Okay, welcome everybody to the artist uh, talk, the first artist talk of the BN artist talk series, uh, BN Textile Art Biennial just started last week in Kran, Slovenia, and I'm very excited to introduce Bob Scholte, one of the most uh, recognizable Dutch contemporary artists and a founder of the Rob Scholte Museum in the Dutch city of Den Helder. Uh, Rob, it is such an honor uh, to have you. Uh, the talk will be moderated by Polona Torkar. So, Rob Polona, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Zala. Thank you for inviting us to the first edition of Bien, which fills a gap in our space. Uh, there is a need for such festivals, so uh, here to the next one already. And, um, of course, join this one. Rob, uh, Rob hi. Hi. So it's it's an honor to be interviewing you, to be hosting you at Bien. Uh, perhaps we should start at the beginning of every person's life. So um, it seems to me it might be a simplified uh, uh, um, understanding of stuff. But when we are born, first we only absorb. We absorb ideas. We absorb uh, images. We 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 kind of uh, construe for ourselves the system, uh, a set of rules which we follow, which we uh, kind of imitate in order to uh, be functional in a system in life, basically. But then there comes puberty when such, such uh, rules need to be deconstructed and we, we find a new form to express ourselves. So uh, as I read, uh, for you, such a moment was in also in puberty, as I understand, you started collecting images yeah. um, quite avidly. Can you perhaps explain how, uh, why, how come the image was um, was uh, the thing that attracted you? What attracted you in images, and uh, what made you synthesize them in and give them give them a new meaning? Oh, a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. One go, but I, uh, yeah, I started as a matter of fact a little later, uh, actually. So it started not with images. I, I started to use images for the first time as I wanted to draw certain things which I could not uh, fantasize myself. I always thought I, I had no fantasy, but the only thing I could do was combine those images. And then I got real new meanings, and it was the first form of. Uh, yeah, receipt how to make something, let's say. That's how it started here in this same room where I'm now, crazy enough, I am in my uh, boys' room. I was here from my 11th till my 17th. Then I flew out of the window over there uh, and never came back. And uh, and now that I was thrown out of my, my museum, I didn't have any, any other living quarters. So I'm back in the space where it all started. So when you talk about puberty, that was taking place in the same place, on the same spot that I'm sitting now. Only the windows that has the sun coming in, they were not there. They were later made by my father. Hey, but uh, to uh, the images, yeah, the collecting of images. Um, I was like uh, explained to to uh, to uh, your technician, uh, and he was telling me that he was a singer. I used to be a singer too. And I was, it was the time of, let's say, after the punk music came the new wave and the, 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 yeah, the Per Ubu, the talking heads, and you had the sort of fresh music at that time. And I loved it. And I, for two years, I was playing around. But I noticed that I could not, as a composer, dictate my will enough on the members of the band as I was not so formed in writing music or doing things. So I, at a certain point, I pulled out. I was not a, enough in charge. It was a great experience to be the singer of the band and to uh, to enjoy the public re reaction, etc. But at the same time, I missed something. And this control I had with painting, at that time, you had the young Italians. They came up and the young French painters, the young Germans. So in Germany, the Moulin of Freiheit met uh, Walter Dahm and Dokopil. The Italians, Clemente, Cucicia, and, and the French guys, Hervé de Rosa and Kumba. So it was the, the, the brewing ground. So there was a sort of after punk situation. And, and there was, of course, the squatting movement in the Netherlands, which uh, I never lived in a squatted house. My, my whole generation lived in squatted houses at that time. And there, of course, this principle that later became so important in my work as well, the idea of copyright. So who owns uh, an image 
is an image free available? Why cannot I paint this bottle as it has a trademark? I want to, so I cannot express myself in every way that I want. And that plays out the first time in the squatters movement. In the squatters movement, it was, so he squatted a house that was from somebody else, but he didn't use it. So it was left unused for the public and it was like a theft from the public. So you can have ownership that is a theft, a theft from everybody. So, and this uh, was also the justification, of course, for the, for the squatting movement. And art became a sort of justifiable, justifiable fill-in of those spaces as you made your own gallery there. Okay, that's how I started. And then, of course, this was wild painting. So wild painting became a sort of dogma. I myself had other uh, associations. I had uh, very much loved always the work of Gerard Richter and Sigmar Polke, great painters that are technically also very good. They're, they can use super realism. I also found out that there was no limit to what I could paint. I could paint everything if I wanted it. And, and uh, I loved also the idea that every painting had its own painting formula, formula or its own image. As if you saw an exhibition of mine, there you saw an exhibition of 20 different painters, let's say. Um, that was not, uh, so it was like David Bowie, that you could, uh, that you could design your own uh, you know, destiny. So ch 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 changes as a principle, postmodernism. So then it became postmodernism became, it was the time of Baudrillard, Lyotard, all the philosophers, Foucault. And, uh, but it also had to do with the meaning of an image. So if you place a certain image, uh, a red flag here is something else than a red flag there. An arrow that goes through a heart is something else than an arrow that kills you or something. There's, so there are different meanings to the same images and uh, to play around with those meanings. So that also meant that those meanings were not uh, an, uh, an uh, effect of the piece, uh, the image itself. It could, the surrounding formed it. So it was contextualized. And this was a sort of play that, that I did and that I was involved with. And then, uh, of course, I was completely contrary to the, to the ruling wild painting at a certain point. So I painted pornographic magazines. I did the craziest stuff. But, and I became a sort of contrast with my surrounding because that's how it works. It always is sort of principle like, uh, like uh, it's an answer, a question, answer. And it is in that space where you move. What is your surrounding? How can I look different? What is, well, how can I defi define myself? Okay, so I, I became very glorious in that sense. So I was invited to very big shows. I was working with the biggest gallery of, uh, of Germany, Paul Mens Gallery in Cologne, where also uh, people like, uh, like uh, Luciano Fabro, but also Keith Herring, also Jeff Koons, others were also working. Jeff Koons, only one exhibition. He later went to the Kiefenberger Gallery. And he left uh, men's, but but that's not what it's about. It's the context. So you come in an international context from Holland, which was quite exceptional. We also we only can uh, can acknowledge the quality of artists only when they are abroad. So you have to go abroad, like Mondrian or Van Gogh, to get the recognition inside your own country. Uh, that that is sort of rule that uh, that is really playing out. So I did all the shows. I did uh, was a sort of factory. I worked with assistants. I was one of the first people to be public about the fact that I didn't make all the paintings myself. Of course, Rembrandt used the same technique. He had a lot of uh, assistants working for him. Uh, for me, there was a group of four or five people that I had inside my studio. It was the time that Art in America was taken out of the out of the shop because they had articles on how our other artists like Frank Stella were using assistants, and the artists didn't like it. So they pulled the Art in America out because they didn't want to explain how they made those pieces. And it should be the, the lonely genius, a la Van Gogh, which was the rule for the art world at that time, not a factory, for sure not a factory like Damon Hurst or, or Jeff Koons, or I did it at that time. The nice thing was that you could have, uh, that I still had not enough for the market, of course, the market asked much more, I remember that I was, uh, a true keys gave me an uh, introduction to Tony Sofretti, the dealer in New York, his dealer, the guy that uh, made Guernica, sprayed on the Guernica as a sort of uh, act mm -hmm. of art or something. Well, he, uh, he offered me a show and I was so fucking happy. And then I, then I left the gallery and he said, can I ask you one question, Mr. Scholt, how many paintings you make a year? And I was working with assistants at that time already. I said maximum 20. So I was more like Vermeer, you know, somebody mm -hmm. who works a long time on a piece. So I could, do, could not do the production. So then I started to, 
I can yeah, and he said, well, I cannot work with you because America is not only New York, you have to do Aspen, you have to do Miami, you have to do LA, you have to do all the Chicago. So we cannot do it. And uh, uh, yeah, and then I came disappointedly back home because my move to America well, had not succeeded. And uh, uh, I started to concentrate on production, how a reproduction, how you commit reproduction. So I bought my own silk screen shop. I started to print canvases. In this way, I could make three uh, for a series in three so that I could have three exhibitions at the same time. One in Munich, one in Amsterdam, and one in Tenerife. This was really not uh, got extra breathe, extra, extra uh, oxygen by it. So that was, that was, that was good. Then I, by my working with assistants, I got asked by, the, by Simon Levy, who was the director of Rijksmuseum Amsterdam, to do an enormous commission project in Japan, Nagasaki. There they had to rebuild the whole city of Dutch buildings. And they had the royal palace that was completely imitated. One stone for stone was exactly built the same. Even the gardens were more original as the royal family didn't have the money to pay what the Japanese could pay. So they had to even make the gardens according to the original drawings. And then I was asked to do the central hall, which was a 1200 square meter, uh, 360 degree floors and ceiling and a tower and to, uh, to make my design for it. Okay, and I thought, oh, well, what a thing. So I made a design, I was accepted. I was four years in Japan working with four Japanese assistants on the site, four European assistants, eight men on the job. And we worked four years to complete it. And then I thought, now I want to do something else. Then I, then I thought, okay, I buy a, a keyboard and I'm going to play a microphone and I'm going to simply not do the Michelangelo game anymore, but I'm going to do my, uh, something else. And then I was bombed, so I lost my legs. Then you lose also your self-image, so you, you have to get used to your own image. So I could not, the idea of standing on a, a stage was an impossibility. I could just not imagine myself doing it, so I didn't do it. I was not going into the music and I pulled out. Uh, I went back to the island where I was living, Tenerife. And there I rebuilt myself and uh, my work. It, uh, but also there, there's a bigger project, even that this wall painting, this was enormous. It was Michelangelo, but then I did a flag project. It was a sort of, I was sort of center of the world. And with my flags, I was organizing the world, which was an incredibly exhausting project I did for about two years, incredible. And then I had to flee to Holland because Child Protection Service wanted to take my child. And uh, we, uh, we yeah, the problem is if you have, if you're critical on society, society uses everything against you that is in their power. So that means you will get uh, tax, uh, the tax office will go behind you. They will, mayors, they, they let you pay. They, they give you a bill of 150,000 that you have to pay in three months or something. That's a way of ruling you and psychiatrics, of course, and, and protection service for children. That is used against anybody who raises his voice against the state. These are the first, and I think it's in your country, the same, the first means of power, you know? So, uh, so but uh, then I went uh, back to Holland. I rebuilt my life and finally, I decided because the house where I was living in at the coast was uh, was being torn down because I was not the owner. I was only renting it and they wanted to build something else. And I had to leave that place. And I went to an old post office in Den Helder, which was very beautiful because the enormous uh, hall, which I can use as a studio and a nice place for living. And downstairs, there was still a post office, but that would leave soon. So I finally could also rent this place. And I started with the help of the of the city a museum uh, and that museum grew where we had a lot of visitors from all of your home we had a lot of publicity and etc but in the back of the mind of the city was always that they wanted to make something else they wanted to do something else they wanted to earn money with it and with me they couldn't earn that amount that much money as when they would develop it themselves so then but i was a problem of course because i had a sort of renting contract and finally the judge also said i had a renting contract but uh, as it's connected to a uh, working space, is it uh, a space that's only for living connected to the working space? So if the working space, you're expected from the working space. Also, my, my living quarters are gone, my studio is gone, which is not correct, and which is still on trial. So we're still on trial about this. But they evicted me with police, so I was thrown out. My whole collection, museum collection, which was international art, is my own art. My whole studio and all the storage that I had was taken. And I have not seen it since it was taken out for three years. I am not allowed in 
which is against the law. Uh, I cannot let somebody buy something, so I'm not able to earn money. This is the reason that my mom offered me to live with her, with my wife and my child. And uh, now uh, I, of course, uh, am the musical change a little bit because we're not only in art anymore. Uh, I think, and I wish to talk about this in the pre uh, pre artist talk uh, talk that we had. Uh, that that uh, I consider also what I do now, which is not making a drawing or a painting or an embroidery. But I, cons I consider every activity that I do as part of my artwork, which is my life, which is the person that I grew to be. So, but I don't know if it gives you the answer on the images which you mm -hmm. originally asked. Uh, what you gave us was a blueprint of your life, which indeed uh, sometimes when when I read it, for example, uh, reads like a, a good novel. I mean, you yeah, had. Uh, you have you have every experience imaginable yeah. so but i would um, there was also a question uh, from the public about the accident or uh, the assault you you suffered but we could perhaps focus on that a little later uh, per, uh you mentioned in the beginning uh, of um, your answer a few points which i find interesting so you mentioned punk and the squad culture which yeah. kind of, of I would say aims at subverting uh, 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 standard norms. And you mentioned copyright, and you also mentioned um, the way the modes you work. So with assistance and uh, and I'm so company, um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you uh, in, at the beginning of your career, you did a lot of work in collectives. Yeah. So I wonder, since uh, you were I'm not left elected, it was more uh, I was uh, living with my wife. We had very little space, and then we found out it was better to continue all each other's works as mm -hmm. a sort of uh, realistic, realistic future. So uh, I'm not not very much part of other collectives. I had collaborations that I had with Peter, yeah, yeah. Peter Schroof and other good paint. Yes. That's so I, <coughs> excuse me. I okay. was wondering when you uh, you visited several. Um, art institutions, uh, learning institutions, academies. One, one, one two, or two, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, since there is this tradition, or there was this tradition um, in the 19th century and before of imitating learning by imitating uh, the artist who came before, what was the, the general outlook when you were studying? Uh, yeah, what well, was the I, attitude I think, I think towards... The principle, the principle is still the same. Uh, there's mm -hmm. two ways. I was. Of course, I was educated myself. I finished art school, uh, but I was never painting on art school. I was do the, doing audio visuals, which was new in that time, so video and, okay. and animation movies. But in my last year, I was working with my girlfriend on the works on paper, and we showed that. I showed that. Um, but uh, and painting, of course, was very popular in that time. So I could. Uh, I had an enormous breakthrough with that work, and we were. Um, and then, uh, sorry, your question one more time. You said uh, sorry. So uh, I mean, unique. since you since there was this yeah. concept of copyright, but there is this tradition of uh, I was, learning. I was, thinking, by... I was thinking that I broke off and I went into my own uh, mind again. But it has to do with the guilds, guilds, mm -hmm. the our mm -hmm. guilds, and the old way of learning was that you were to become a master, a master in painting, a master in philosophy, a master in building building churches or whatever you were first had to be a student uh, so it's like a sort of freemason structure you you grow and you get more and more and more and then finally you kill your master not literally yeah and you, make, and you make your masterpiece that you present and then you become independent and you become a master like your master right so this in a way uh is uh, the, the, the the whole school system has destroyed more or less uh, this idea uh, when when people are close to one teacher, uh, they most of the time start to be like the teacher and they don't work like I described in the contrast that I described before, mm -hmm. that you try to defer from your refinement and in this way you can people can recognize that it's you because it's different. Okay, but a lot of people start imitating or start doing work which is totally a, a continuation from the work of their master. I had the same situation. I was professor in Kassel. Castle is the city from uh, Documenta, mm -hmm. and uh, I in that Documenta history, I was joining Documenta myself in '86. I was invited or '87. Mm -hmm. It was Manfred Schneckenberger who made it, 
And then uh, later I was asked to be a professor in 1991. And there is still the old school system is still running. So you have a, you had the klasse, klasse de klas, Gerard Richter de klas, uh, uh, Joseph Boys, just to name the old Dusseldorf gang. But you have that in every art school. There was a class of school. And it was great. Uh, I was not living in Kassel, so I was there only for two weeks a month. And uh, I had great assistants that continued to work if I was not there. And we were they were also building a system like we're using now, like the Zoom system, to connect as students with me in the time that I was not in physically at school. So, uh, but th there you have a sort of one-to-one -one situation. But it depends also, on the, of course, on the professor. I mean, I had 100... 20 different students, which was also a problem because the number, if you're very attractive for students, you can have too many students and then another professor has two instead of 20. Uh, so there is mm -hmm. much difference and that has nothing to do with quality, but it's sort of public po popularity or something, which is difficult for teachers between themselves to, to deal with. Okay, but then at some point I was, uh, I was asked to be there every week, three days. And I was living on Tenerife, so I had to resign, which, which I did. I was the first professor to resign from that university in 120 years, I understood. But I, I closed my job. It's a job for life, so you're crazy with such a salary to stop. Later, I also thought, well, I wish I hadn't done it because it was the money was gone, right? So then, and then I, but I concentrated on my own things. Uh, after my return in Holland, I had very composed works always with, with real meaning really with a certain position, really meant to be shown there. So if I show at the Venice BNL, which I also did, I make spaces especially for the BNL. So there was, uh, it was at that point, they wanted to organize a sort of, well, a world exhibition. It was later in Frankfurt, of okay, later in Hanover, World Expo, sort of, uh, sort of uh, showing themselves off. And they wanted to build uh, elect elect electric chairs, stairs on those bridges. So they were really crazy. And so I was joining hands with the with the Academia Academia Fedova, for Emilia Fedova there, and I made no expo pieces in my show, and I was trying to defend the the, the authentic quality of Venice against the money that they wanted to pump in at the same time take the spirit out. So I like to connect with situations that that I'm in, and uh, uh, that is still that is still the case, but much less after my whole period after the bombing, because after the bombing, I found a totally different lifestyle and totally different values. Uh, but not my work changed first, not so much, but later after doing the Japan project, after finishing that, and also uh, being in reading very much, uh, closing myself away, I didn't want to work with assistants anymore. I wanted to work on myself for my own situation. I had a wife, which, which you, you met her, uh, you saw her with my, with my child, I have two children. But so uh, to the start of a new, a new situation, and I also decided that I didn't want to judge anymore because uh, judgment is almost also uh, disconnecting us from, from reality. We cannot, we cannot really open ourselves if you have judgment, prejudgment. So I, I myself, I tried to also, in my work, I had always judgment. So no expo, so not this expo, not do this to the fans. It's judgmental, right? So that I was against the people who wanted this expo to be done there. So, but then I thought, but but we are all one. So the world is a oneness. So we have we have uh, we have this. I I always feel like I'm connected to to everything, and I'm just I, I'm the only one that sees it. Like you guys are the only one that sees your world. It's a sort of projection from us. At the same time, we see we see killers, we see rapists, we see we see a lot of people we cannot we cannot uh, maybe connect with it. They don't have our values, but we are all part of each other. And uh, so, if you beat somebody, you beat yourself, right? And uh, so it, it is like, um, and so in my work, I wanted to show that as well. I wanted to be less judgmental, and therefore I I said I have to find a form that accepts everything. Then I found mat matchboxes, for instance, or I found um, I found uh, the tapestries that I started using when I came back from Tenerife in uh, 2004. I found that all the shops in Holland sold the works that I saw hanging with my grandparents and with when I had visit, and they were all they, nobody saw any value anymore in them. So works that that my grandma was 
was knitting for, for four or five months on, on every night if the papa was looking at the football, that it came hanging in the shops for one euro. Uh, let's say, so six months work for one euro. And so I thought, this is crazy. This is sort of a human investment that is so in contrast with the them start to uh, really systematically all the tapestries that I see. I didn't even know at that time what I wanted to do with them. I wanted to preserve them, to give them back to value. So I surrounded myself with 30 uh, embroideries of the Re Nachtwacht. Uh, 50 pieces of certain milk, milk made from uh, Vermeer, because the Dutch ladies, because it's mostly ladies, sometimes men, of course, too, they, they also express, express the love that they felt for certain buildings, for certain persons, for, for art. And so, yeah, and, and uh, so it's an expression from a lot, and there is no value, but there is an enormous value because it's human investment, uh, hours and hours of work. Okay, and then I, at a certain point, turned them around, those, uh, those, the, you, this, and well, you, have, you have seen them, and I, I take one, then I show you. I take one, knife for one. So. My, wife, my wife said, you should show uh, some, because they are not there. So I have, so she, she bought some this afternoon in the shop, because there are second-hand shops all around, and everybody's selling everything that he has. But uh, here's, for instance, a sailing she, she you know, it's it's beautiful, and mm -hmm. it, of course the front side is like this, it's like this, which is very neutral and it's all very well done and it's it's more or less flat, sort of flat image. But this one is so alive, as as there are uh, st sticking out uh, elements. Uh, so it is also and the the woman they don't want to spend the money, right? So they don't want another piece of wool. So they try to continue and connect them. And so it's a, like an economics choice also involved in this tapestry. And so I, I think, I, you know, when I do, I turn them around and I frame them like I like them because it becomes sort of paint. There is a sort of relief in them. Mm. So that's how it all started. And uh, that became quite a success. And I, I, I had the feeling immediately as I did it, this is historical. This will be important in years from now. And uh, that I think is the case. So, uh, so, uh, but then of course I always change my ch 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 changes. So I start uh, being interested in new things, and I start to build up new things, and I start doing new things. And then my collectors always say, "You know, what you make now is so terrible." You know, it's always the last thing that I make are always the most terrible. And then uh, they get used to it again, and then they, yeah, they start liking it. Maybe sometimes, or maybe not. But then they, they asked you still of something available from that time. So that's how my work progressed always. But there's, yeah. Before we go to, uh, to, to um, later. Sorry, I have my, my, sorry, I have my, my phone, uh -huh. my headphone. Sorry about it, sorry. Before, before we talk about uh, your museum, I would like uh, to delve a little bit more into the question of your view on copyright or the appropriation of images from the past. You seem to have gar garnered a lot of, how do you say, Discussion. Uh, attention, attention yeah, because yeah, of uh, uh, different uh, yeah. ways which you reappropriate. Well, it has to do with what you, what you asked me about the learning process. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, and, it's right that you true imitation, that's what you said to yourself, a true imitation, okay. you learn. Okay. And that's true. But and uh, I, I, I myself, I think uh, we should have a copyright free world. Okay. And that is really, I think, the most just world. Because uh, look, there's two ways of using something. Eh? You can use it commercially, so that you, you reproduce, and it becomes more, you start selling it. And if it's not yours, yeah, you do something that I think is illegal because you have the source of the material is important and should have, of course, its part. But if you um, look at images as IDs and as uh, and in use in the artistic process, I think there should be total freedom, uh, which I think is also the case with uh, in, in science and medicine, because also there uh, the, you can uh, not read that paper. I think all papers shall be available and for us to read. I remember when my papa, who was in a big, uh, big company, they had all these computer systems and he was so enthusiastic about it. He said, you can read everything everywhere, which is not true. But they all block it. You have to be a member or you have to, be, have to have a special account or you have to pay. So it's not free. The internet is not free at all. 
I cannot reproduce certain stuff. I cannot read certain stuff. I cannot know certain things that are especially important now in the kind of crisis that we have. Is it necessary that people are have can have access to information uh, that they can uh, that they can learn what they want to learn? And I think that's that is one of the most important goals of any liberation movement should be the the freedom of copyright. And in a normal social system, you pay back as you pay forward. You know that is that is that is a normal conditions. But I mean, really, the 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 the, the the invoices that that fly around on the internet sometimes because you illegally use the photograph from some kind of shit event that is that i think is absurd and there are whole companies and lawyer systems that that make their money on this i think it's not agreeable and if you look at medicine before and you had it with the aids medicine aids medicine was copyrighted then you had the antidote the acet People wanted to get that, but they had, didn't have the permission from the patent firms. It was all patented, of course. Now, some governments, especially in Africa and uh, third world Afri uh, uh, South American countries, and they, they started to do their illegal uh, distribution and production of these medicines. And I think that's those things, it should be allowed. I think it should be free because now in this world, look, the COVID-19 is patented. There's patents. Of, uh, of uh, guys in Rotterdam who did the first version, and then you have the pen that goes on, and Fauci has now. There's people earning money on these facts, and they're ruining people's lives. And I think it's criminal. It's, it's very criminal. I think a lot of copyright is criminal. It can be criminal to be the owner of houses, but not to use them for the population, to pull them out of the circulation, and to use them only for your lust for... Uh, power, let's say, and not use them. Space has to be used. Space is scarce. Images are also scarce, and I think we should be able to to use them, like we want to to extend our mind and to extend our lives and freedom and our happiness. And uh, that's ultimately what everything should be uh, should be for. I think. Mm -hmm. This is this makes a, a, a perfect introduction into our discussion about your museum. So you opened the museum in, in Der Hind Den Hilden, Den Hilden, which, which is was, the uh, big navy uh, place. Eh? It's the yeah, yeah. Which I, under, I understand was quite deserted since the navy is not uh, functioning in such a big scale as before. And your contribution to the community was quite welcomed at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's also how I met your Bien Biennale. Because mm -hmm. one, one uh, friend of mine, she was working there with a certain gallery and she came to visit with the gallery and that's how we met and that's how she introduced me to you guys. So that's how that went. So please explain to our uh, viewers and to me, of course. Uh, uh, what... I was always, I was always, uh, I'm somebody who loves documents, books, mm -hmm. uh, materials, photographs. Uh, I always keep everything where everybody else throws it away, I have it. So I have an enormous volume of stuff great stuff you know uh, first printings but also and I, so i and at some point i i uh, i could uh, acquire certain works a uh, whole series and i thought this is so big i want to show it to the public i always had it in my mind so i was just running around and looking for spaces where i could open this museum it wasn't first not in den helder but later i got an offer from den helder for an old fortress it's a military city uh, and it, it was built as a matter of fact by napoleon he built this whole fortresses and they're all bases of him and they are used but they're also now the military pulled out a little bit and uh, now it pulls in again but it's because nato has extra funds and etc but at that time so and then they said you can build a museum here and we even have money for you and i said great i'd like to do it uh, they had hundred thousand i could rebuild the place and it was great so i had a friend there was old machines in it for making uh, for for the electricity of the navy in case something happened, but they were so old. The, even in Africa, they didn't use it. Nobody wanted to have it, so it was old iron. And I had somebody to take them out. Okay, but that was asbestos in the pipes, so the asbestos needed a special company to put it out. Then I found out that I could get it out for ten thousand, but the people that I was working with from the city, they wanted to 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 pay fifty thousand. To another party instead of my ten thousand, and I should agree with the fifty thousand. That was, of course, because it was a payoff to everybody in between. It was a sort of corruption scheme. So I found out that the whole thing was corrupted, and that all the money that's replaced between the government for subsidies and two special uh, 
to special private parties, there's always a hand in between that, that pulls things out. So, and that's also the reason that I lost the museum finally. I will explain you. So, but then I br they broke the contract off with me because I didn't want to agree upon the deals that they wanted to make. I do not going to sign for 50 if it's 10, okay? I don't want any part of it. I don't want a part of anything like that. So I went back and then the downstairs floor of the place where I was having my studio, my lift, it was a beautiful space, very much designed. Uh, we had a period of the 50s after the war. Then Helder was bombed very much by the by the Allies, as it was the main center of German occupation, Atlantic Wall Center. They saw that the whole D-Day would take place on that spot, so they fortified the whole thing. And um, and this, but of course, due to, due to bombing in the fifties, they had to rebuild a lot. This period was called Weder Weder Aufbau, the Weder Aufbau, is that you rebuild everything. Mm -hmm. And this post office was a real fifties building in the style of that Weder Aufbau. It was a monument, an absolute monument. Great spaces, I loved it. Okay, and but then I uh, uh, also the people loved it. So the city asked me to write a business proposal. How oh, great! I was taken seriously. I wanted to write, of course, the plan for my own museum. I had the collection. I had everything. I we had the people, the volunteers to work for it. Everything. I had the support of the population. And then uh, the, the, I should do a financial proposal. Okay, then you want to find out what is what is the value of the building and how, for how much I can buy it. They didn't want to tell me any price, no price. Then I want to rent it. Okay, but then you want to know how much the costs are in the year that you have to pay on top of the rent to find out if you're able to pay it, right? So ask for what the services were, uh, the electricity, the water, the gas, the special tax that you have for them. They didn't want to tell me, nothing. I could never hear any fact about the building. So I could not make any financial support, financial uh, bottom to my, to my proposal. And they don't, didn't want to give me the information, which sounds ridiculous, but is of course making everything impossible. And then they closed my proposal down and turned it down because it had no financial, um, financial statement in it. I had no financial statement because they didn't want to give it to me. Now, finally, I found out why they didn't want to give it to me. I tell you why. Because if they had given it to me, then I would have known how the price was that they paid for the building's electricity. But if you get much more from the from the city council, let's say you get for the building 120,000 a year, but your electricity bill is only 8,000, there's 112,000 that you cannot that you cannot uh, prove where you, where, you, where you left it, right? So they didn't want to have those numbers in the city hall, in the city council. So, and that later became also the reason for my, for my, uh, for my eviction. Apart from it, that at first my business proposal was turned down by the mayor and the, and the council. And then later they, uh, they, uh, they I, I had the contract on the building. So I start, I decided I rent this, it was a good price. My rent was that I made the museum. And on top of that, I paid a certain sum a month for the electricity. And then the same problem happened again because there was one statement in the contract that the yearly have to tell me how much was used. So I paid one and a half year, but I asked for the for how much it really was, because I used much less. There was no heating, there was only TL, so mm. it was not so much. And they didn't want to give it to me. And the whole period they had the museum, they didn't want to give it to me. And that was, again, the same reason that they took money out of the amount that they got for this building. From the city, uh, from the city council, so it is corruption, and the corrupt to this corruption, I was also thrown out. But if you, if you don't want to count down every year as it's agreed in the contract, how much I have to pay, then at a certain point I stop paying. Of course, now this I should not have done, of course, but I did it, and then they affected me because I had not paid my electricity bill. You know, that's more or less the story in small, but this this total wall of of of. Uh, unwill to, to close a deal has, of course, a certain reason. And will we find out now in the procedures that are taking place what it is, because we're also going to hear the mayor, the mayor of Den Helder, will be under oath, has to testify, OK? These are things that, um, yeah, that will show much more than about the whole, uh, how politics, culture, and everything is woven to each other. And of course, then I come to the new situation that we're in now, that we're that I'm busy with the internet, with talking to you and with doing my website and being a correspondent for Before It's News, the American side. 
So that's, this is what I do now, but uh, I consider that uh, very creative and very necessary also mm -hmm. as a work to do. Uh, I would ask you, can you explain what is the legal basis for them to, uh, uh, to, to take all your possessions in terms of all the artwork uh, you that, have uh, accumulated? That, is, that I have to pay the cost for the eviction. Because, look, and my lawyer never told me that this could happen. Short before it, friends from the, from let's say the alternative uh, media scene in the Netherlands, they came to me and said, we have to talk to you. You have to, you have to, my glasses, there's one glass missing from my, uh, but, but uh, you have to talk, you have to do something now. You have to make a foundation that you bring all your art in a foundation that you cannot take it because they want, they are after your art. I have an enormous collection. It's almost 8,000 pieces. I think it's much more even. And there is there is uh, much material that's never seen. It's it's historically important, it's culturally important. It's also it's cultural art history of the Netherlands through my connections with writers and with painters. So it's it's for many people very important. Now they want to auction off in uh, in a in a place that's a special auction house uh, where you do bankruptcy. So if you bankrupt and the leftovers for your company are put there, that is to make the price low as possible. Because, of course, they want that it has no value because my museum in the city, they want to uh, make it look like it had no value. And then they threw me out for a good reason. You understand? It's very, understand it. it's a terrible play that is uh, going on. But uh, they took it to cover the cost from uh, fiction and the rest of the cost. Of course, the, there was so much stuff in my mind. My, my, normally, you take things out. But I'm a man without legs. I'm handicapped. I have a family, school going kids. We had no money because all the money had gone in the in the in the, pro the procedures that they put against me to get me out. I had the last thing I know that I paid forty thousand to my lawyers, and I was broke. And then you have to move. How you rent the trucks? How you do that? Where you get the energy? My volunteers. You have to volunteers, but you cannot even rent the trucks. So I decided to stay and use the politics, go into the politics. There was an extra meeting of the city council. They wanted to decide and make a motion for the museum. But it was in between the, it was a, there had been an election that was been in between the two, uh, the two coalitions. So there was, there was not, uh, the, the mayor was on himself and in his own, he decided to put me out. I mean, uh, yeah, but I, I had, uh, and then the legal basis for taking everything. It was 40 days that it took. They had 120 of those enormous storage trucks moving out of it. And then uh, take in picking everything that had value in their opinion, not knowing anything, of course, that was a good thing, but bad on the other side. So a lot of personal stuff is also with them on, on, and they think it's art, which it's not. And this is the situation, three, three and a half years, they have it now. And it's cost 10,000 euros uh, a month, the storage. So it's 120,000 a year. So also in storage, I have to pay almost half a million euros in storage cost. And it's not because I made the storage contract, but because they made the storage contract. And they want to put all the costs as high as possible to bankrupt me totally. That's what they what are doing, what they are doing. But I think this uh, has an end now. I was not able to visit my works ever. So I never saw my works back. And that is, a, uh, it is legal. I mean, you have the right, of course, to visit your own possessions. I, I never had that right. I was always refused, refused entrance. And I'm absolutely certain it's not complete anymore as it was. Because, I mean, one silk screen is something 500 euros. You know, I have four, five, six, ten thousand 10,000 of them. You understand what I mean? So it's one, you pull it out. Not everything is numbered. It is a crazy situation and it is uh, very much the unlawful situation that I think exists in many parts of Europe at this moment. Uh, and mm -hmm. we, I think we all have uh, problems with this form of uh, law. It's not the law of the land. It's not the law of the people. It's the law of the bureaucracy that is self-fulfilling itself. I mean, if you ask for uh, the building was sold. Till now, I could never see the selling contract, the contract, the sales contract, and it's completely black because there are a lot of secret deals that I cannot know about. You understand? Mm -hmm. Next, this is the 21st of June, we have a special court meeting where we hope to open all these things that they uh, uh, were managed to close down, although there are laws that oblige them to open them up. I mean, yeah, the, the, it is, the law is great, but it's the people who adjust it that are not so great. That's the problem, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, uh, okay. Um, I hope your case goes well. I mean, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I will, I will, I will, I will be well. Sure. 
but can, can you perhaps contextualize what's happening in your case uh, into a broader perspective of the Netherlands? Uh, I, I, think, Slovenia... I think it also it, I think it also had to do with the with the, I'm not a Freemason. And that's very important. So I have always, every wind was always against me. And it was a pure coincidence, or if it fitted their own, their plan, that I could, that I was allowed to do certain things. Uh, I think that is very important because you're not under oath of secrecy. Uh, and uh, you, the, what uh, the, the Helder is, of course, one of the most secret underground bases of the of the Netherlands. There's sort of underground base. Uh, yeah, there's there's illegal activities there because we are connected with drug trade in the in the in the Caribbean. We have Caribbean colonies like Curaçao, the tax haven of the world is Curaçao. That is under uh, Dutch rulerships. Uh, we are one of the main colonial powers, of course, and it was also the place where, in the past, during the Golden Age, when we ha were having in ships entered into Holland, and therefore, of course, the first load got off was kept secretly and then they went to the ones that uh, asked them to sail in the first place and that was the here van amsterdam the here van horn that was the ones that paid for the condition and there the load got off the official load but it was also an illegal load as well and when a part that was uh, put off board and that was always in den helder you know so it's uh, like i was living on tenerife there you have the same between south america and between europe Tenerife is the base. So if you come with stuff from South America, you drop it off, the best part stays in Tenerife, and then you go to Madrid and to uh, Lisbon. Uh, but uh, th that is the, that is those connection points always have a secret base. And that was the case there as well. I think it's an underlying ground. Uh, uh, also. My, my question was more in terms of, of, thank you for your explanation. My question was more in terms of how um, um, artist spaces in, uh, are they under pressure? Of, oh, very uh, much have, under pressure, very much. We, very we much. have cases in Slovenia and also all across uh, the Balkans. Uh, there are evictions like yours, yeah, I sure, mean, sure, sure, on sure. different bases. Do you think, uh, I mean, you also mentioned in I the beginning you, that, yeah, Please. I think I think there's a war going on on everything that we like. So uh, that human that makes humanity. So art is the most human expression form there is, and it teaches people. It teaches to express. It teaches to communicate. It teaches to love. And I think therefore, it has to be torn down by those who rule this world at the moment, which which is completely in contrast with with the opinion of art. Art promotes love, art promotes communication. And here, the rulers of this world are satanic, satanic, and are completely in another way. So uh, everything that we think, they think different. So peace is war for them. And uh, yeah, they, and I think that's the main reason that art is so much under pressure. Here in the Netherlands, for instance, the museums, I just got a mail today that said the museums would open, I think, the 8th of June. But everything else was already open since April. You know, the only thing that was blocked is art. Now, you know, if you have to work without visitors, your staff goes on, museum costs money to run it and to keep it prepared for an eventual opening. The, 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 the hate almost of the minister in charge to art. Uh, you know, there was a letter, that open letter to the minister. And he said, well, we can do something else. We can take a, you can take a, you can take a ride or you can you can uh, go to the movies uh, the movies are also closed but i mean there is a sort of this it's it's it is less than everything else because it's the highest you understand what i mean it is everything is the other way around so what is most important for me is the least important for the power and that is worldwide at this moment so we see a sort of absolute autocratic rule uh done by total dis dishonesty i mean for me truth is the number one uh, direction in my compass in life, and uh, the, the, the here it's totally contrary. You 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 are promoted if you can lie, you are promoted if you can kill. So how how ter more terrible you are, higher higher you come in the hierarchy. The hierarchy is devilish, and is all around the world. It's all, everywhere the same. It doesn't matter at your at your country. It will be the same as mine in all the Americas, in also in the East, this is the rule of the world. And that I think we have to break now. And I have the feeling with the, the thing that happened uh, with Trump, 
and with uh, Q, this will happen also. There will be a, an enormous shift, in my opinion. There is an enormous awakening, as they call it, in, in, those, uh, in those groups and, uh, going on. We see more and more of how the how the how the the, the power is uh, yeah how the power is. We see it more and more. There is nothing that will be left unseen. It's Bibleish. I think I think we're in uh, the fulfillment of the Bible's uh, prophecies. I think that's what is happening. I really think the second nation is the six 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 mark of the beast, and I think we cannot get away from that. And I'm really my whole family is fascinated. Um, but I think they connect themselves to something that is not natural and not in the image of God. So if you change the image of God by connecting and changing DNA and putting other animals in and etc. and connecting it because it's not a medicine, it is not something that protects you to an illness. It is something that changes you, connects you to the internet, connects you to 5G, puts metals through spike protein in your body these spikes and you get magnetic and it's not for nothing. I mean, this is how uh, Rwanda started eh? in 95. Uh, can I uh, ask you a question? You mentioned that now uh, your art is your life. Uh, do you think the, the forms of art we have known since this uh, pandemic, oh, I'm sorry to mention it, uh, are they adequate for us to deal with such a situation? Do we need uh, uh, new forms of art to tackle this? Yeah, I think I think we do. I think we do. But, but on the other hand, I mean, we should not forget our craftsmanship, our uh, our love for material, uh, our our touching of each other's skin. All right. Mm -hmm. So th this is the main thing, of course. And it is only by absence that we sit here and cannot talk to each other in reality. And uh, if you kept that in mind, I think we can develop new strategies. Uh, you can make you can make shows. I, I saw that there was a real physical form in this in the Bien Biennale. I love that, of course, because that is my my yeah that is my that's my passion. But on the other hand, we can also uh, try to share the information that that is necessary. Okay, you you one you have also a responsibility in the world that is that if you know something that is important for others, that you share it. And that it that people can read it. That's why I'm also for this open information society, instead of an society that is blocked by entry fees and copyrights, because we need to have access, everybody of us, to the material. Not that everybody wants it, but but uh, my mother says I don't want to know anything about it. I take uh, for the fever. I take for the yearly fever uh, shot. I take. I said, Mom, it's come something completely different. It has nothing to do with. It. I don't want it. It's the same. I love it. Okay, perfect. Ignorance is a choice. You choose to be ignorant. It's one of the seven deadly sins, right? Ignorance, stupidity, because that's what it what it is. Not wanting to know what people put in your body. Come on, hey, that is too much. How much trust you can have in the state? I don't trust the state so much. I was shot by the state. I was uh, blown up, and I was all my stuff was taken. I was fighting for 25 years with the state. So for me, they are not a reliable partner anymore. I think it's a more crime organization. As a matter of I understand. Uh, of, in terms sorry. of the experiences of your life. I'm sorry, I'm sorry but that's. Uh, but I'm also uh, open to any other. Uh, other it is people. hard to be yeah. trustful. Yeah, sure, but and it's not. I have trust in people. I have trust in 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 us. And there's no. That's not. There's not a, a stand that completely rejects people at forehand. No, no, no. It's still they prove not to be reliable. That is it. Until that moment, I go along, all right? So, um, but I mean, I think a very high percentage, 95% of the judges is Freemason, right? So 95%, you cannot never have an honest judgment because they always, and that's what they promised each other in the oath, that they will support their brothers against the, uh, the Gentiles, that they call it, uh, that are outside the movement. So they are also always, they will always use that. And that makes every so everything so slippery and so false and so so uh, so dishonest. We need to stop that. Another thing: this is a male organization, right? Only males. There is, of course, female groups. But what we also have is the 21st of December last year, when we have the shift of eras that is taking place. It's it's Aquarius, the time of Aquarius. It's a big change. And as a matter of fact, it's the change of the rule of all the men ruled by one woman that and it now goes to a new world where we have all the women that will have the power that will do the justice 
that will put that vision for the world in power. And there is probably one man that will. Say, I mean, okay. if there is a future of equality of men, all men and women, I, uh, I think we should look forward to it. I think we can. This, I think we can. At this moment, I would ask our uh, attendees if they have any questions, please uh, raise your hands or uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, put on your camera and your microphone and ask it. While we while we wait, I wanted to ask you another thing. Uh, you, yeah. I'm sorry, there is a question. Um, mm -hmm. It's in the chat. So also for all the attendees, um, ask your questions in the chat. It will be answers and they're welcome. So the question from Kiket is, uh, excuse me, if this is too personal, but you mentioned you were bombed. Can you share more about that and why? I will, I will. I cannot tell everything, but I will tell as far as I can. I will tell it. Uh, my wife was uh, pregnant. I don't see myself anymore. Is that correct? And I don't hear anything. Is that also? Uh, we, we see you. And okay, perfect. We'll and now you. I see you again. Good. So uh, in the morning, eight o'clock, I went uh, and drove off with my car, my, my, my wife, with some piss in a bottle for the, for the doctor. We, got to say, we lost our first baby. And I, uh, she said she was pregnant. I didn't believe her and I wanted to know for sure. She had done a pregnancy test, but she couldn't show that to me. And then, then because yeah, it was important for us, the first one was a full born child, fully grown. So I, we went off and then in the corner of the street next door, uh, as I was going through the corner, it was an enormous white flash sort of, uh, and, uh, and uh, next moment I see that uh, there's a hole in the ground under my feet and uh, that was a car bomb, but it was a special bomb because later I also met the guy that produced the bomb and uh, he explained me completely how he had made it and what, what was what was meant to be. It was the second, they had, the first bomb didn't work, so they came back to him to, to he was, they were supplied with the first, with the new bomb. Okay, the, the police said something else. It was a bomb uh, going on distance. So there was somebody also in the street having to pull a button at the moment that I passed along. And there was, of course, somebody who put it under the car. I know all the names. And there was somebody who organized it. And there were other people involved in the scenario that was uh, done later. Okay, but I went, uh, there was an ambulance coming. Uh, I had a sort of moment of death. I disappeared. And I was, just, uh, I saw a sort of Buddha sitting uh, uh, with a certain way with his legs that it looked like he had no legs, right? And he was smiling at me and then went, went back and I was, uh, I was still unconscious. And I was uh, in an ambulance and they, I went to the, to, the, to the hospital. There I was guillotine amputated. So they amputated my legs. As it was not uh, too safe anymore. So much fragments were in. Later they removed almost 250 fragments from my body. So much uh, bomb elements were there. Okay, I was three days in coma. I wake up and my wife comes to me and she says, uh, I, I was, I'm completely in bandages, everything, my legs. So I cannot see if I still have hands. I cannot see if I still have legs. I ask her, uh, my uh, hands, she said, hey, that's good. That's all okay, don't worry. My legs, they're gone. Okay, they're really gone. Up above your knee, all right. And then the police came in the, in the hospital uh, room. And the first thing they asked me, and that was such a deep shock. You should imagine you're three days in coma, right? You wake up, you just heard that you have hands. Wow, I had my hands still, right? And the police comes and they ask me if I had done the attack on myself. All right? That was such a shock for me that I was not able to continue this, uh, this interrogation. And uh, well, this, I, as a matter of fact, this continued to the whole investigation. The investigation was on me. My computers were taken, my friendships, lovers, connections, everything was checked because they could not believe the life that I was living. I was a professor in Kassel. I was doing a project in Japan of this size. Mm -hmm. And I was living, living on Tenerife on that island and I had a company in Amsterdam. They couldn't combine it, right? So they couldn't imagine somebody living like this and flying between the locations and running this as a business. So that's what happened. And uh, later I found out, but I found that was all very quick after that I found out that as a matter of fact, the person who organized it was, uh, he was, he was commissioned to do this. And 
The idea was not to uh, murder me, not at all, but it was to take my legs. My legs, they wanted. Uh, one of the, the one who pushed off the button, he lay, he called the police at 10 o'clock. The attack was nine o'clock in the morning. At 10 o'clock, he started to call the police station to see if I was still alive, yes or no. Because I, if I had died, the job would not have been done in the right way. Okay, he was taken by the police. He was three years, three days in, interrogated, but he was thrown out and never to be heard again. That's the letter that he got. So he's completely free, but he's of course part of the attack. As a matter of fact, I know all the names. Okay, then I uh, the, then you have the problem that you know all the names, or not all the names, because later on there was the completion. I, for only um, let's say in Den Helder, I found out finally who put the bomb under my car, who finally did really attach the blue with the bomb with the magnet for the distance under my car. It was not a hand grenade. That's what the police said. Not at all. That was just to mix up the public because there had to be all the time a different idea about me. When I woke up, I did not know from the from the three days in coma, I did not know that at the same time in Los Angeles, there was a newspaper out that said the attack is not meant for Scholte, but for a criminal lawyer. So it was a sort of, uh, they took the wrong person out, which of course was not true, but this is what the public thinks now till today, because it's part of the cover up. As a matter of fact, it's pre-thought part of the attack. So that's what uh, more or less, I hope it gives you a sort of impression of what happened. Okay, so uh, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, then, uh, yeah, it was the, the, the threats went up on till uh, maybe last year or two years ago. I mean, really, it's nonstop. Eh? The ones that uh, did this are free and protected. I myself, I was 13 years in courts because in a certain newspaper, I had named the name of one of the major attackers and I was uh, by public office. They prosecuted me for 13 years. And finally they said they could not uh, unfunkelijk, so they, they cannot make this, the punishment work. But I had to sort of, um, ah, good. Then, then I was uh, was threatened outside the court and I re I said to my lawyer, we're, gonna, we're not gonna to a high court, higher court anymore because I will never, uh, they will never accept anything more than what we did now. So I accept my loss. And, uh, but they never interviewed any of the attackers that I named, the, any of the attackers that I named. And there, the, was, there was a sub-question from uh, the same, uh, sorry. Kick, from Kikert. Uh, um, uh, he commented that, uh, of course, what he described is uh, terrible, uh, but he uh, wonders if the, the, the events uh, in any way affected your art. I've made myself humble and uh, humble and sexually I had to find my own ways again because you think you will never have a woman again if you have no legs. So I had to find my, find my own form and my art, I think it was in the beginning not so effective. Maybe later on, yes, but it was after finishing the Japan project, like I explained, that I thought, uh, okay, but it's, yeah, but for, and you know, it's the same happened there. Uh, I got a I got a girlfriend on Tenerife at a certain moment, and I was always I was complaining about the guys that did it to me. They're also artists. They saw those as, as an artwork. You know, it was a, yeah, it was a, a golden golden schnitt. So, uh, yeah, you know, in English the golden uh, special. Uh, don't talk about that. But they saw it as an artwork. She said to me, why, "Why are you talking, guy? You should be happy. You should be you should be graceful to the ones that did this to you." And that was just such a shock, but she was right. It took me, it took me two, three days. And I was completely in love with her, so it shocked me extra. But she was right. I shall be grateful. I shall honor them for what they did. They gave me this life. They are in this guilt the rest of the life. They have to live with their own judgment because, of course, the last judgment is your final judgment that you have yourself about your own life and not a God or anything. You judge yourself. And this judgment is eternal. So, uh, so they have to live with this. I mean, for me, they're, they, I'm not gone for, from their life. They're gone from my life. I, can, I have forgiven them, but they cannot forgive themselves. And that is really what has happened. And I know I have to be grateful to them. I also, yeah, I also prayed for them at certain points that I really asked for their souls to be, to be. yeah, of course. 
But this, but my art, yeah, my art changed. Yes, it changed, of course. But I, I told you, I could not move so easily from the canvas anymore. So as before, I liked. If you're a painter, you like to go a little bit backwards to see how it works, the effect that you that you made. That's of course not possible in a wheelchair. There it was, and to be in a high painting, I could not do it. So I always need a lifting machine to pull me up, like right. uh, Chuck Close or uh, that he used to paint the portrait painter from the stage. He also has this. Yeah, but you can do it. It's not. It's not a real problem. It's not a real problem. Uh, perhaps in conclusion. Uh huh. Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah, uh, they said thank you. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. For being thank candid. You. Okay, thank you. So, uh, if there's any more questions, I would like to ask our public to to submit them now into the chat. But we referenced Nagasaki, your work in Japan, several times, but never really went into it. I think this is your biggest work. Uh, correct yes, correct correct yeah well it's a 12, years 1200 and... square meter painting it's uh, it um, it depicts in the words japanese the history of uh, sailing uh the history of sailing between japan and the netherlands but it is not so it is a painting that goes from very positive a father that shows his son uh, a ship and they sail small ship of course and they they he explains the winds and the, how the world works it's beginning very positive and fresh also in the sky and every and it and it develops into a nightmare and it goes from uh from one there's a direction of reading and the interesting thing is that we start with the positive side but the japanese as they read the other way around start with the negative side and that is that is so beautiful and that comes hard in a certain line which is exactly in the north and the floor is made out of mosaic floor, like in the in the Renaissance and Middle Age, and it's made stone for stone for stone. And it are compasses that all point to the north. This is this line between the beginning and the end. So it is it is beautiful in its in its composition and structure. And there's a tower of 80 meters high, which shows a uh, star sky. And uh, it looks like everything is playing in the canals of Amsterdam. Finally, if you look at it, because the balcony is made of bridges of Amsterdam. And therefore, you get the idea that all the water and all that sea painting that is there, sea painting is something really special. To paint the sea is so incredible. You see that with William Turner and with others. But I love it. And, uh, and but it looks like this whole battle, this whole development for small boy and growing up is in the canals of Amsterdam. So it's also, again, in a, in a bottle or something. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice. And I'm very proud of it. It is, uh, yeah, it's, it had a lot of visitors always. And what I hear now, and that's also part of an answer to your uh, question that you already put, as part of how they want to destruct art, what I now understand is that they sold the whole uh, complex and they want to use the space for something else and they want to get rid of the painting. And it could very well be that they already destroyed it. Because in my life, so many things are destroyed. Uh, uh, fire uh, sculptures that were set on fire. I have things that were stolen, and, and it would not surprise me if finally it ends up. I end up with uh, with some television programs that put it on, uh, put it in picture, and that the, finally the whole work of four years is totally destroyed. I really can imagine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. It's really a magnificent it's a work. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. magnificent work, and I, I wondered. Perhaps for my last question, what were the reactions? I, I, I understood it as, in a way, a story of imperialism. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, colonialism, and, I, imperialism, yeah. and I also um, understood that the the place where it's set, it's supposed to, um, how do you say, honor the relationships between Japan and yeah, yeah, the, the, the Netherlands. Tell you a very short. I yeah. tell you the, there was always a monopoly. First was the Portuguese had the monopoly on Japan and the trading with Japan. Then we beat them, and we had to sort of deal. The Portuguese wanted to bring a Roman Catholicism to the Japanese. They didn't like that, so when they they boiled them later and ate them for sure. And but we had to deal with Shogun that we only use a special island. Uh, I, I lost the name for a moment. It was a special island. We could come with our ships and be there, but we could never leave the leave the island. We were not allowed to. You were sailing one year. And you could only stick on that three square uh, square kilometer where your island was. And one time a year in a closed uh, couch, so not being able to view outside, there was one representative, Holland, had uh, the permission to go to the Shogun to make new business deals. And then the ships were sailing. Okay, there were three ships. 
one was hope, and the other one was, um, and there were three things, hope, et cetera, but the one that only arrived was love, liefde, het schip de liefde arrived, and that's also a sort of symbolic sense. It was also the place where the atom bomb, the first atom bomb ever was dropped off, it's Nagasaki, Hiroshima Nagasaki, and it's exactly on the spot where all these people were buried, that is, place was built so there was even a lot of japanese friends that i met and they thought they were ghosts and from the victims of the atom bomb and so i never noticed anything of that but it was of course cheap cheap property cheap ground where they could do a project like this but, uh, but i i think uh, another thing uh, being in the condition that i'm in and losing my all my possessions for so long made me accept and also understand that material materiality is not important at all i mean if the peace disappeared it will never be gone and you understand what i mean you can destroy it but you can never destroy it as i i will i and the others who have seen it and also others will be able in this total conscious they will be able to visit and revisit you cannot destroy anything nothing nothing except the truth will come out that's what i'm certain about that's a perfect statement to end our conversation. You, I wish you well in all your fights. I, thank you so uh, much. I hope for the best and thank you for this converse, conversation. I hope, I hope in the future to be connected to your initiative and uh, to do my part. Thank you. Yeah? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you to Zala. Thank you to Bien. To uh, everybody Wale. involved. Yeah. I'm happy, very happy with the conversation. Thank you. My sweetheart, I knock off now. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, Rob. Thank you all. Okay. Also the technical. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See if I can get it out. Huh? I have to oh. leave. I don't have a red button. But even I'm sorry, there's only one glass now. So that is. Okay. I would just make a final remark. Thank you, Polona. So before we say goodbye, um, I would like to invite our uh, listeners to our other artist talks. All of them were curated by uh, Spila Gale. Uh, next Monday, we're hosting Canadian textile artist Tina Schruters and a week later, uh, Jurari, textile artist from Iceland. So follow our program at uh, liar.si slash bien. And Rob, it was a real honor. Thank you so much. He left already. He left. Mm. Bye bye, Rob. Okay, ciao.